All right, so last time we studied uh, some example of degeneration technique applied to the sheaf moduli of coherent sheaves, um, um, kind of relating sheaf counting on generic fiber of a family of Calabi Yaust, related to counting of those things with relative condition along some divisor on the special fiber of this family. So I would like to switch gears and talk about one of the most important property of DT theories. So I'm going to talk about DT theory of torsion sheaves, torsion sheaves and modular forms. Okay, so <laughs> as, as it is the case for gramma witten theory and so far the DT theory, there is always some underlying physics or ideas from physics lurking behind the scene of looking at this particular problem. So let me tell you a little bit about the physics behind it. So physics behind um, study of torsion sheets. Okay, so this is hopefully useful. Um, so there is, we are going to talk about super Yang Mills theory. So super Yang Mills theory um, on four dimensional manifolds, on four, on, on four manifolds. And then this is about supersymmetric, supersymmetric black holes, black holes and modular forms. Okay. Um, all right, so let me set the geometric <laughs> characteristics of this particular physics problem. So let S standing for surface be a four manifold. I will just put four manifold with complex structure. With complex structure. So I would like to think of this four dimensional manifolds as an algebraic surface. Algebraic surface over complex numbers. Defining equation of it is defined over the field of complex numbers. Now, what are the ingredients for super Yang Mills theory? So ingredients for um, super Yang Mills theory, super Yang Mills, theory on S, okay? So what is that? Um, first of all, you need, so very similar to mechanics, let's say if you wanted to study classical mechanics, your underlying space is R3 or R4, a space time. And then you describe some energy for moving objects. So that is the kinetic plus potential energy. So you need to define fields as you have seen in quantum field theory and your energy functional or Hamiltonian is some integral of fields. These fields are sections of a vector bundle. For instance, if you are really looking at integral of velocity fields, um, one over two MV squared, right? So that's the integral. Okay, if the velocity field it is, then this would be the velocity fields are given as sections of the tangent bundle because tangent bundle to R4 would be infinitesimal velocity vectors. And so far, uh, classical mechanics, we have the energy. So similar to that, super yang mills theory has an underlying four dimensional space. We would like to think of it as a four manifold with complex structure, which is an algebraic surface. Then we need the gauge group. So G, gauge group. 
So certain symmetry, gauge group, um, uh, here for us, we would like uh, we would like to have G equal to UN, okay, unitary gauge group. And okay, and let um, E be a principal G bundle. Principal, principal G bundle over S. So, you know, um, for instance, in the classical mechanics problem, if I have, so here is the thing, if I have this example in high school, so if I have some object with the mass M and it is moving in some direction, um, I can calculate this Hamiltonian energy. This is going to be kinetic energy plus uh, potential energy. And this is some integral. And this could be itself some integral in some gravitational field. So it is like that. And then I have certain symmetry, global symmetry of the problem. For instance, if I take this whole picture and if I just make it a constant shift, and move the picture over here, um, equations of motion will not change. If I rotate this whole picture with some angle, fixed angle, equation of motion will not change. If, um, if so the, basically there is translation and there is rotation symmetry in classical mechanics. Now in physics, you're integrating some, you're trying to define some energy with some integral of fields. So these fields, you multiply to each other, you're, you're kind of integrated over some measure over your space. And then you would like to say that, what if I act on these fields by some elements? So you have some group, this is a group, which is a set of certain elements, Gn. And what if I act on each one of these um, fields by this group? So if I modify my fields by the group, let's say G1 or Gn, Vn, and it, okay, so of course energy functional changes, um, but if the group is the gauge group, then that means that your equations of motion will not change. And so this is basically the context of gauge theory. And we have seen this kind of thing, for instance, um, many mechanical systems will have this gauge transformation. So um, um, for instance, um, again, in classical mechanics, if you have your cup of coffee and it is, let's say hot, um, the temperature is a manifestation of the kinetic energy of the molecules in it. As you're drinking your coffee, um, if you're sitting in a spaceship, and a spaceship is rotating with a constant speed, not accelerating, then the temperature of the cup of coffee will not change. And um, again, that's a rotational symmetry that your mechanical system has. So basically um, this gauge transformation and gauge symmetry is beyond that. Uh, you don't need to, so in this example where the where we are shifting things by translation, or we are rotating the whole sheet of paper by some constant phase, this is global symmetry. But it could be that your transformation you apply to your fields are local. Um, so you can check, uh, take any of these fields we want to be in and kind of locally modify them, act by a group on them and things like that, multiply them by something, or apply an operator on it or something like that. And that's a local transformation because you're not applying this transformation to the whole space. You're applying different elements of the group to fields in, in this theory and in specific locations even in this theory. And yet it is possible that uh, your equations of motion of this mechanical system does not change. And that's a very good example of local gauge symmetry, okay? So this is, this is basically 
what it is. And Supriyamin's theory is a quantum mechanical theory that um, has gauge symmetry. Okay, so we need some mathematical object that captures this group of symmetries, local symmetries of the theory. That's the group G, which is going to be gauge group for us. Um, similar to the example where you're calculating kinetic energy and you're integrating velocity fields and um, basically um, then finding the kinetic energy and these velocity fields are sections. These are sections from underlying space-time to the tangent bundle of the space-time, right? Those are sections. And similar to the fact that this theory is translational and rotational invariant, it means that the bundle, which uh, captures, whose fibers capture the velocities, um, velocity vectors, is somewhat compatible with respect to uh, moving fibers under the action of translation or rotation. Um, again, it could be that this symmetry in the problem is local. It's uh, given by a more complicated gauge group. And in that case, you want the bundle whose sections are the fields you're integrating to exhibit this symmetry with respect to action of this group. That's why the mathematical formulation of this is that you need the bundle, vector bundle E, which is a principal G bundle. When you say principal G bundle, it means that in fact, the fiber to fiber translation from going one, I mean, you cover your space with open sets and you look at the trivialization of your bundle over open sets. And on the intersection of open sets, the transformations are given by elements of the group G, basically matrices which are given by elements of the group. So you have a principal G bundle. Uh, so this is the ingredient you need. Okay, so that's that. Second ingredient you need, let A be A one form given as connection. We know what connection is. You have probably taken differential geometry so connection one form, differential form, it's a one form, and it's a connection on this principal G bundle E, okay? So that's the second piece that you want. And then mm, three uh, is the curvature form. So we need the curvature form F of mu nu. It's a two form. It's given by taking the derivative of the connection one form. So it is like, this minus a mu. So this is how it's defined. And we need that curvature form. So this is a two form. Again, if you have taken differential geometry, you know what the curvature is. And then you need the Lagrangian action. As I said, there is something, some integral that you need in order to ca calculate energy of the system, Lagrangian action. And in, um, in uh, physics literature for super yang mills theory, this Lagrangian is uh, for mm, n equal to two, d equal to four super yang mills. But I mean, whatever these means, they basically tell you what kind of symmetries that this quantum mechanical theory has. So you need the Lagrangian action in terms of in terms of F, which is your curvature form, F mu nu. Okay, so what is the Lagrangian action? So let me tell you the Lagrangian in super Yang Mills theory. Um, so let's call it S of super Yang Mills, the action integral. Uh, actually, bad notation, I think. Oops, what happened? Oops, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so something happened to my. Ah, okay. So, um, so do you have any questions so far, by the way? I don't know. Things are pretty standard physics stuff, so it's okay. Okay. The Lagrangian of Super Yang Mills. Um, actually, maybe I should put it as a sub index. Why not? 
Lagrangian of super Yang Mills is given as an integral over the algebraic surface S, the space-time manifold, the four-dimensional manifold of one over G, the um, basically of this form, F tensor, F star, star F, and this is the Hodge star dual, Hodge star dual of F, right? Plus integral over S of I times theta F wedge F. So, okay, now it makes sense because F is a two form and Hodge star dual of F is also two form. So I have a four form. And same thing in here, this is a two form and this is a two form, right? And when I wedge them with each other, I get the four form and this is dimension, real dimension four. So real dimension equal to four. So it makes sense, this gives you scalar functional. Now, what is G and what is theta? These, these are parameters, underlying parameter, underlying parameters of super yang mills theory, certain parameters. So both of these guys. Um, this particular parameter is called the coupling constant. This is the coupling constant of super yang mills theory. And this theta is just called phase parameter. And actually, there is something nice you can do with these parameters. So, um, and rewrite your integral. So remark, remark, what we can do is define a new mixed parameter, which is made of these two. I call it tau, and tau is going to be theta, divided by two over pi plus four pi i divided by g, the coupling constant, okay? This is beautiful, right? So now g is positive. So four pi is positive, g is positive. And uh, this is something that lies on above the real axis, and I have made it into I made this tau into a complex number. So tau belongs to the upper complex half plane. This way, upper complex half plane. So what is what is the point though? The point is that if I can put these two underlying parameters of Supri I Mills theory next to each other, I can rewrite my integral. So let's rewrite it. The then the super Yang Mills action integral, action integral can be written, can be rewritten, rewritten in the following form, in the following form. So this super Yang Mills action integral can be written as, i over eight times pi integral over s, the algebraic surface, square root of the coupling constant, but then tau bar, this is the complex conjugate, com complex conjugate of tau, f positive wedge f positive minus tau, F negative wedge F negative. All right, and then F positive and F negative are self-dual and anti-self-dual uh, two forms induced by the connection two form. So what is the F positive? F positive is the self-dual two form induced by F, the connection curvature form, it is defined as one over two very easily, F plus Hodge star dual of F, that's it. 
And F minus is the anti self dual part, anti self dual. And it is given, defined as one over two F minus Hodge star dual of F. So original integral is written in terms of F and Hodge star dual of F and F measure itself. If you reshuffle things around, you can turn that into um, an integral in terms of F, the anti self dual and the self dual parts of the connection to form, the curvature to form. Yeah. Okay. So that's your action integral. Now it has this variable tau in it. Okay. But then why is it that we are doing that? One of the good things about writing things in terms of the variable tau is the following. You have the super Yamel's action and the integral, which is written in terms of tau. So it's a function of tau now. Yes. And tau lives in the upper complex half plane. So if this is the real axis and this is the imaginary axis, tau lives in here. So this is H positive and tau belongs to here. Okay. Then there is an action. In fact, there exists, there exists an action of SL2Z on upper complex half plane. This is very nice. So SL2Z acts on upper complex half plane. Therefore, it acts on the parameter that gives you the Lagrangian super Yang Mills action integral um, in terms of tau. So that super Yang Mills functional also sees the action of SL2Z because it's written in terms of tau. So what's the action of SL2Z? Action of SL2Z, SL2Z is the set of two by two matrices where A, B, C, D are integer valued and A, D minus B, C is equal to one, special linear two by two transformations. So that's that. And so action, of SL2Z on, um, on upper complex half plane is defined via what it does to tau, right? Because the points on the upper complex half plane are now tau points. So there is the translation action that takes tau to tau plus one. And there is the Mobius transformation or S transformation that takes tau to a tau plus B, C tau plus D, where A, B, C, D is acting as an element of SL2C, right? And honestly, like if you wanted to have this thing, this is also the T. I mean, the T, you can find out what is the entries of this matrix T, what, what it should be, okay? All right. So, okay, so you have that. And what is the advantage? The advantage is now that you can actually see that not only you have this local gauge symmetry, you have some kind of a transformation, SL to Z on your super Yang Mills theory. And you can investigate what is the consequences of this action on your integral. So this symmetry, so turns out Turns out that um, under this action, this action, the equation, equations of motion obtained by taking by taking derivatives of L S Y M are preserved and hence L S Y M tau further has S L two Z symmetry, gauge symmetry. Mm 
okay? And so if it does, then this is gauge invariance and in particular space of solutions to equation of motion will not change under this action. So in particular, um, the space of solutions to equations of motion to super yang mills equations of motion um, will not change under this action. Okay, um, good. So if you're a physicist, you know that for physics, it matters that we find the vacuum states of a theory and those are minimizers of the super yang mills action integral for us here. So you need to optimize this functional L S Y M. And there might be one solution, two solution, finitely many solutions or a space worth of solutions. And then the space worth of solutions, which is the space of solutions to super yang mills equations of motion will also exhibit this symmetry, okay? So now we would like to know what is that space? Yes. Um, um, question, what is the space parameterizing solutions? to super yang mills equations of motion, okay? And what are the consequences? Consequences of this gauge symmetry on it. Okay, we want to see how many of such solutions we have. And okay, it's a space worth of these solutions. And so we need to find some way of algebraic or geometric way of seeing what this space is. And maybe even count the number of solutions somehow. Yes. Um, so indeed, in fact, this gauge symmetry um, induces a certain numerical numerical symmetry, okay, on partition functions. partition functions which count um, number of stable, and I'm gonna be very sloppy in here because I don't I didn't tell you what a stable means, number of stable solutions to equations of motion. Okay, yeah, so the physicists always like to do that um, in super Yang's theory. So physicists say, yes, there's a space um, of possible solutions. Maybe this space is finite. Maybe this space is somewhat countable. Therefore, I can count how many such solutions I have. And immediately physicists would like to set up their partition function whose coefficient, coefficients count these number of solutions to these equations. Okay, so let's talk about this partition function a little bit. Partition function, partition function of solutions to super Yang Mills equations.
Okay. All right. What was our integral? Let's write it again. This is our integral. In terms of variable i, it's written as um, modulo coupling with some parameters, tau bar f plus f plus minus tau f minus f minus. Okay. So essentially, I need to take derivative of this integral, this whole thing, and set it equal to zero. And that would be equations of motion. And hopefully, I would find out of solving those differential equations, the choice of curvature forms, which minimize the integral, right? Because these are the only functions in here. Tau is just a parameter, right? Tau is, doesn't see anything about the theory itself. The only function that we're integrating in here is the curvature too far, right? So result of this, need to find, need to find all curvature two form, two form F, which minimize or optimize L super Yang Mills. And those give me, if I can find them, it's basically solving those differential equations. Those are, those are solutions to equations of motion. Okay, so we now know what's the space that captures these solutions. The space is a space that parameterizes curvature two forms, optimizing this integral. So I need to understand what are these curvature two forms that optimize this integral, that's all. We need to, for that, for this, we need to consider, consider all connection one forms, connection one forms, we called it A, that minimize, that induce minimizing F, curvature two form F. Yes, because curvature two form is given by derivative of connection one form. Yes. Okay, so here's a fact, there's a fact. The curvature two forms, two forms F, which minimize Lagrangian super Yang Mills are given by, given by harmonic forms. harmonic two forms in Durham in uh, Durham cohomology of S, right? So uh, two forms or any N form, right? Any N form, if you give me some M form, if this is an N form, it belongs to, as a differential form to HN of your underlying variety. But then by Hodge decomposition, this can be written as the sum of HPQs, all different ways that you can break a complex valued form into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic pieces. Harmonic forms in particular, harmonic forms, are always are of type HP comma P, always, meaning P and Q needs to be equal to each other, okay? If it is a four form, for instance, it will be two comma two. 
And if it is itself, if F is two form, therefore F needs to be, needs to be of the form H11. So something purely holomorphic or purely anti-holomorphic doesn't work. It should have a DZ wedge DZ bar. That's what makes it harmonic form. Okay. Um, all right. And the cohomology theory of S um, with real coefficients, that's what we mean. Yes. This is basically their home cohomology. Okay. So, okay. So we know that it turns out solving the differential equations, which we obtained by taking derivative of this whole thing and setting it equal to zero, gives us differential equations out of which we know that this needs to be one, one, four. Okay, how many such one, one forms do we have? As you can see, differential two form is an element of cohomology. This is the whole very, very important point. You can study differential forms, but the space that parameterizes differential forms is the cohomology theory of the underlying variety S. Therefore, in order to see how many differential forms are there, you need to count them, not just the differential form itself, but the, their cohomology classes, okay? So these are one-to-one -one bijective correspondence between the differential form and an element of cohomology of the underlying variety which sits inside cohomology theory of S. So for F, harmonic, harmonic one, one form with class, harmonic one, one form, mm, we can count, we can construct a partition function, a partition function as follows. So result of solving this differential equation basically is this fact that the form that we are looking for needs to be harmonic form. That's it. So what is the space of solutions to super Yamil's differential equations? You can easily with confidence say that a space is the space of harmonic forms on S, variety S. And then what is that? Well, you say harmonic forms are elements of cohomology. Those are one comma one classes. So all I need to do, I look at the space that parameterizes one comma one classes and I count how many of these one plus one comma one classes I have. So the partition function is written in terms of counting how many of these one comma one classes we have. So this is the partition function. I'm gonna call it Z partition function, partition function of one one classes in S or in cohomology theory of S, right? In cohomology theory, of S, that's it. How nice, no? So let's construct some Q series. So I'm gonna sum over all, all elements in lambda. And lambda H2 is H2 cohomology lattice, cohomology lattice of this underlying variety, okay? All right, so that's it. And then what is it? The Q series. The Q series is going to be Q to the one fourth minus M comma M plus M comma Hodge star dual of M times again Q bar, okay, um, minus one fourth. Okay, um, minus one fourth times something, some parameter A, and I'm gonna write A here. A is defined as M comma M, right? Minus M comma Hodges or dual over. So this goes to here. 
okay? And Q is, you might say, what does it mean, complex conjugate of Q? Q is e to the two pi i tau, okay? It depends on our parameter tau that we defined before. And now you're asking, what is M? M, M is the cohomology class, class associated, okay, to harmonic form, form F. So M is defined as class of F, which belongs to this H star of S, yes? M is that. So what does M comma M mean? I mean, you might need to know what are these terms really mean? Okay, let's write it down. So M comma M is defined as one over 16 pi squared, coupling constant square root, inner product of F, Hodge star dual of F, S. And M, comma, that is um, one over eight pi squared, S coupling constant, F comma F. Okay. So you see, you see we have, we have, F times Hodge star dual of F and F times F. So class of F is M. So now I'm writing everything exactly the same way, but in terms of the class of the harmonic form. Okay. So M comma M is really this integral and M comma Hodge star dual of M is this integral. Okay. So that's it. And this gives you a Q series with different powers of Q, but many of these, as you change M, will be equal to each other. So if you expand this Q series, after some time, you can see that this Q series will have many similar powers, Q to the Q bar or Q to the Q bar uh, A uh, times Q, you know, Q to the Q bar B and so on. And these Q to the Q bar A again, Q, Q bar B again. And these things couple with each other. And eventually you will have some Q series in terms of the variable Q. And this Q series is the partition function. So it's true that everything is in the power of Q, but because of many terms which have the same exact power, eventually this will be very similar to some sum AI Q to the I, basically. And that's going to be our partition function. Okay. The point is that the power of Q is written in a way that it depends on looking at all possible M's. So if we can count M, then we can calculate the power of Q, then we can construct our partition. Okay, so this is what we want. And so, okay, so we have this. So our Z of Q is now written in terms of Q, so Q is e to the two pi i tau. Tau is basically, we, we discussed it before, theta over two pi plus four pi i divided by a coupling constant, G. So Z of Q really is Z of this tau also. So same way that our action integral was written in terms of the variable tau, after optimizing the integral, finding the solutions, counting how many are they, which means really counting how many harmonic forms we have on this algebraic variety. The partition function that keeps track of that counting problem also is written in terms of that tau parameter. Well, why is this useful? Well, again, under this change of variable right here, the partition function z, is actually written because it's a function of tau and tau lives in the upper complex half plane. It's a map from upper complex half plane to the power series 
in variables q and q bar. And, and q and q bar are written in terms of tau, right? So then again, not only the action integral itself enjoys the action of SL to Z, the partition function also enjoys the action of SL to Z. Why? Because I can modify the power of Q by two by two matrices. So SL to Z acts on the powers of Q in the partition function that counts harmonic forms on the algebraic variety. Okay. So this gauge symmetry, as you can see, kind of persists to show itself as we go along in all different aspects of this theory, even in the level of counting solutions, okay? All right, so let's just see. Uh, so let us assume we have we are interested in U1 gauge theory. Theory on S. So what that means is that SL to Z is always A, B, C, D. This is SL to Z and U1 are the diagonal pieces, A, A. So U1 is sitting inside here. So U1 is actually acting on this. So, all right. So um, let's just see how is this partition function sees, seeing the action. So Z of tau can be modified under, in general, in general, under action of SL to Z on upper complex half plane, uh, we can write the following Z of tau maps to Z of some element A, B, C, D acting on tau, right? So what is that? So this would be Z of A tau plus B divided by C tau plus D. And if, if this transformation leaves us with A tau plus B to some number U times C tau plus D to some number V times Z of tau, if this property holds, then we say, that Z of tau has modular property, modular property under the action of SL to Z. Okay, so if under this action, obviously you can see that this partition function is very complicated. If I change Q to the SL to Z acting on Q, which means in the power E to the two pi I change tau to A tau plus B and C tau plus D, and you do all the calculus, and you can see that this truly complicated transformation somehow spits out the original Q series again, but with some scalar dilating or scaling it, if you can this get this kind of nice result, then that Q series is called to be a modular form under the action of SL2. So that's what modularity means. Transformation of this Q series somewhat preserves the original Q series, but modular some dilating factors. Okay, so this is what the modular property is. So in particular, in particular, if, for instance, A is equal to zero, B is equal to minus one, C is equal to zero, and D is equal to one. So that means that I'm looking at A, B, C, D. If I have this one, right? Then 
I will have Z of A tau plus B divided by C tau plus D, what would be equal to Z of, well, there is no A, and so this would be minus one over tau, basically. And then this would give me um, basically tau to the, so A is zero, B is minus one, and then C, C is one. C is one, yeah, C is one actually, yeah. Okay, like that, yeah. And then this would be tau to the U, tau bar to the V, Z of tau. Okay, so this, yeah, under this thing, if it satisfies this property, then we, we see that it has modular property, but then this particular choice of a matrix, this is the S matrix. Uh, D is, is zero here, right? Oh, D is zero. Yeah, that's right. D is zero. This is the S matrix. And we then we say that the partition function exhibits symmetry under the action of S matrix. Or the partition function after action of S matrix is dual to the original partition function. So there's some kind of duality. And this is the, basically the S duality. Okay. And not only that, this tau switching to minus one over tau is something that physicists are very familiar with. So in Maxwell's equations, if you take electric field and change it to magnetic and take magnetic and change it to minus electric, basically that's reminiscent of changing tau to minus one over tau. That's why this duality that you get in here is also mimicking that duality is called electric magnetic duality. Okay, so that's what it is. Um, all right, so this is what it is, okay? And um, as you can see, okay, so you have this matrix, this anti-diagonal, or it could be diagonal matrix. So these are the simpler cases of the action of S of 2Z on this partition function. The point is that we are trying to see um, manifestations of this kind of symmetry in algebraic geometry. Well, you are in some sense, bottom line is that you're counting two forms on this algebraic surface and your partition function exhibits certain symmetry. And all you need to do is, is there any geometric object that the two form associates to? So that you can look at the moduli space of those geometric objects, what the, which, which the two form associates to, and then say, this moduli space has symmetry under the action of SL2Z. Therefore, its partition function also has symmetry under the action of SL2Z, okay? So is there, is there a geometric object in algebraic surface S, which corresponds to corresponds to harmonic form, harmonic forms F in homology theory of S. Do you know it? Uh, this is the instant on right? Uh, the two form, it's a two form, right? So do you know it? To form? No, yeah. I know. I mean, I know the geometric object should be like something like the instanton somehow. Okay. What kind of an instanton is it? It's much simpler than that. And um, remember that we are counting harmonic two forms by looking at cohomology classes of those things. This is the beauty of cohomology theory. Cohomology class can, from one point of view, correspond to differential forms, but then from another point of view, can correspond to cohomology class of a subspace. What would be that subspace? Okay, it's a two-dimensional subspace in this case. 
Yes, yeah, so it's a one one form. So F belongs to class of F belongs to H11 of S. What is the subspace of S in which, which whose cohomology class sits inside H11? What is, what is the co-dimension of this subspace? The Riemann surface. What is the degree of the H11? It's a two form, right? Yeah. So this is a piece inside H2 of S, right? Yep. What's the co-dimension of the spaces, subspaces of S, whose cohomology is sitting inside H2? Remember dimension of S, the real dimension of S is four. So it's a two-dimensional object. Excellent. So it's a co-dimension, real co-dimension two. And it's a two real dimensional subspace. What is that? Complex theoretically. Complex theoretically, it's, it's a Riemann surface. Excellent. So you see these harmonic forms because they are being realized by their cohomology class in the ambient cohomology theory of S, they are real co-dimension two. And there is actually a fact from algebraic geometry that these are classes of holomorphic curves, curves in S realized as, a, as an algebraic surface. Okay. So you have your algebraic surface S, this complex dimension is two, and you're looking at co-dimension one, complex co-dimension one subspaces, which are given by holomorphic curves. How beautiful, right? You start from super Yamil's theory. You're trying to count minimizers of super Yamil's axial integral. You do some differential equations. You realize that the forms needs to be harmonic. Then how many are those? How many are of those are there? Well, forms, differential forms by their home cohomology are parameterized with their cohomology classes. So essentially you need to count how many one one classes are there. But then one one classes are the classes of co-dimension, real co-dimension to some varieties of S. And via Poincare duality, These are H lower one comma one of S. And these are homology classes of these. So counting of forms that minimize super Yamil's action integral becomes counting of curves, holomorphic curves in S. Isn't that beautiful? Interesting. Yeah. The key that connects physics, differential equations to geometry, as you can agree, is cohomology theory. Yeah. It's only under this, this shelter of cohomology theory that differential forms are, and curves can be related to each other, yeah. basically. Okay, so that's what it is. So, the key is the following. So the statement of super yang mills partition function, which exhibits the modular property is that if I have a fixed surface and if I have gauge symmetry under the action of SL to Z, partition function counting curves inside this algebraic surface S has modular properties. Okay, is it true or not in general? This was all here based on a big if. We said, if this is the case, it has modular property. Or is this the case? Well, it's not the case for you more than you one gauge theory. So if when S is fixed, we only have modularity of Z tau counting holomorphic curves 
in S. Now we know why that is. When gauge group G is equal to U1. That's it. So it's really not the case that under action of some A tau plus C tau, we can have such a thing. That's not true, basically. Only with U1, so basically things like this. Okay, diagonal pieces that sits inside. So what if we want to make the gauge group more complicated? And what if we have the dream of having the most general symmetry of the partition function, counting harmonic forms or equivalently holomorphic curves in this variety? When the, when the gauge group is as complicated as I've written in here, A, B, C, D, okay? So here is the statement. When we generalize the gauge group G from U1 to UN, we lose modular property, modular property of C of tau. This just doesn't exist. However, for UN gauge symmetry, gauge symmetric Supreme Mills theory, there exists a conjecture by physicists. which is as follows. Embed, embed the algebraic surface, surface S into an ambient, ambient Colabial three, Colabial threefold and allow the surface S to deform in Colabial threefold X, let's say, in X. Then count holomorphic curves curves in X, which lie inside deforming surface, deforming surface S inside X. And the conjecture is that the partition function, the partition, function of such counting problem, counting problem actually does have modularity property. Does exhibit modularity property for UN gauge symmetry. So, um, so they say that if you allow the surface S to have deformations inside some ambient space, like that, and if you're counting curves on a surface deforming inside this ambient space, then from here you can obtain some partition function, but this is a conjecture for this system of X and S and tau and tau bar and some variable Y 
the power a, you can get some sum delta in highest or dual of lambda over lambda z of tau theta of lambda plus delta. Okay, so I'm not going to tell you right now what these are, but here is lambda dual is H2 of Xc. Um, okay, is the image of H to S Z, which sits inside because S is sitting inside X, inside H two of X Z, yes, and uh, theta is the Jacobi theta function. Jacobi theta function. Theta function, which is a modular form. Okay. So <clears throat> the point of this statement is that if you have a fixed surface and you're counting holomorphic one one curves on it, then that's a certain counting problem. This partition function for this counting problem does not have CH symmetry unless the gauge group is simple and it is U1. If you want to gain back modularity of counting of holomorphic curves on the surface, you need to allow the surface to deform, basically. As you deform the surface, count of holomorphic curves that always lie embedded inside the surface changes because under many of such deformations, the point is that main point, main point, under many possible deformations of S, holomorphic curves in S will not remain, not remain holomorphic. So count of holomorphic curves that are still remaining holomorphic under these deformations is different than count of holomorphic curves on a fixed surface. Because you're changing equation of these curves too. And if you deform the surface any way you want, highly possible that many of these holomorphic curves vanish under these deformations. So you're changing your counting problem. But in particular, because of that change, Magically, the conjecture actually says that the partition function counting curves in a surface deforming inside ambient polyamide of threefold is going to again have modular property. But this is really, really, really interesting. And the way the physicists conjecture is basically by look calculating entropy of certain supersymmetric black hole which is just totally something different than the machinery someone like me or algebraic geometers are familiar with. By the way, uh, who are these physicists? So this is a conjecture called S-duality, modularity conjecture. By physicists. So who are those things? Who are those people? Gaioto, Strominger, Yin, High Energy Physics Theory, 070201 2V, 2 Gaioto, and Yin, High Energy Physics Theory, 07020. 12 V9. Then there is paper Denef and Moore who worked on this thing. High energy physics theory 070 
And finally, there is Oguri Strominger and Wafa, famous OSV, which is Hydro Physics Theory 04051462. Okay, so in language of string theory, you have system of um, some kind of a M5 ambient 10 dimensional M5 background. Inside that you have the surface S and you have systems of D4, D2, D2, D0 brains wrapping the surface and the surface is deforming inside this ambient M5 brain, which is our Calabi L3. And the count of D4, D2, D0 brains wrapping this surface deforming inside Calabi L3 is a modular form. Okay. So this is all the physics that I wanted to tell you about. It starts from Spriamil's theory and then it's somewhat a modification of Spriamil's theory because in Spriamil's theory, underlying four dimensional manifold is fixed. But now you're kind of made it in a hybrid surface theory. It's not surface theory anymore because S is deforming inside ambient space. So we would be interested in D4, D2, D0 brains or sheaves which are supported on the algebraic surface S. We try to count them. These sheaves are algebraic functions that understand these curves that lie inside us. The curves are the things we are trying to count, right? And, okay, so these are sheaves with two dimensional support and we are looking at the moduli space of those things and we are hoping to calculate their DT invariance and the partition function of their DT invariance we are trying to show has something to do with this modular form. Okay, any questions? No, thanks. All right. So let me come back to the Zoom environment. Again, so the, as you can see, counting problem in algebraic geometry actually relates to counting of solutions to differential equations in quantum mechanics. Yeah. Um, and on its own, counting of sheaves supported on a surface deforming an ambient threefold is important. And it's always good to have a conjecture out there which you can actually compare your results with. And this s duality conjecture in some cases have been proved before. Um, my papers with my collaborators and some of my mentors papers with their collaborators prove this fact. One of them is actually Richard Thomas who at some point for a short period was my mentor at least somehow. And um, he's one of the people that um, actually wrote papers on this thing. Actually, recently also, he wrote a paper which was really nice and to some extent completely solved the problem. We will talk about those. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. So, um, so now you said we've seen that these um, minimizing two forms are like um, classes of Riemann surfaces. And in the physics part, when I did this, it was that the minimizing solutions to this action was the instantons. So how does these two relate in this, this setting? Yeah, yeah. So you kind of need to give the instanton. I mean, what kind of instanton are they, right? See, these are curve-like instantons. You have point-like instantons. You have curve-like instantons. It's fine. So this oh, is exactly okay. what we are doing. Yeah. I don't know. These are... These are D2 brains. But then because okay. we are doing, we are doing uh, algebraic geometry, you know that you do not have naked curves. So these D2 brains are coupled with D0 brains that follow them. So there are embedded points on the curves or off the curves. So it's a D2, D0. But then these curves are not roaming freely in the ambient Calabi L3, but they are actually always supported the skin theoretically on the surface that roams in the Calabi L3. The surface itself can be telling you how you can realize this system as a D4 brain, which tells you where the surface goes, and then the curve D2, D0, which is inside the surface. The whole system would be a configuration of D4, D2, D0 brain wrapping the surface in the ambient Calabi L3. 
Okay. And you know, algebraic geometry is very easily making sense of all of these fancy words. You take the surface and what, how can you find an algebraic object that represents the curve inside the surface? What is that? I give you a surface and I give you a curve in that surface. What is, how, what is the shift that associates with this curve? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, not that much experience in algebra. Ideal geometry. shift. It's the ideal shift. It's the ideal okay. shift. You have a curve C inside S. Ideal shift of C sits inside O of S, right? Now, this ideal shift is a torsion free shift which is supported on the surface. It's supported everywhere on the surface. But the surface in the ambient threefold is co dimension one. So, this ideal shift, you can push it forward into the ambient variety and push forward the, this ideal shift is a shift supported on the surface and understands the curve floating inside the surface, right? Yeah. It's a torsion shift. And therefore, its churn character is zero class of the surface, that's the default range charge, minus the curve class, minus some number. So when you look at the deep brain charges of that, it will be zero class of the surface, some other class, some curve class, some point class. So that's the D4, D2, D0. And it doesn't have any D6 brain charge because it's that's torsion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will, we will write it down very rigorously next time and you will see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. Thanks for coming to the lecture. See you next time.